Wellspring Church of All Nations presents Streams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stokes. Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and joys of a fulfilling, abundant, spirit-filled, and spirit-led life. I'm excited about getting into God's Word with you tonight, and I want to just do a little teaching that I trust will be practical. God willing, I want to start tonight, continue tomorrow night, and finish up on Sunday night. So I hope you'll come every night if you possibly can, because there's nothing more exciting or rewarding in my view than to dig into God's Word and to uh, dig into it perhaps from a point of practical use and practical exercise. Uh, I've learned that... uh, We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God works with us to do that. He works in us. But there's some things that we have to do in order to live soberly and righteously in this present world and in order to live an overcoming life. And I know your desire is as my desire, and that is to live an overcoming life. Because all of the great promises of God in the Word are promised to the overcomers. Seven different times in the book of Revelation when he's addressing the churches, he says, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. Well, I do certain things. And then he climaxes uh, over in the end of the book of Revelation by speaking the eighth time and says, to him that overcometh will I grant all things, and I will be his God, and they will be my people. So we want to live an overcoming, victorious Christian life. And so there's certain things that we have to do from a practical viewpoint to bring the reality of victory through the Word into our lives. All of God's promises are conditional promises. He says, if you'll do certain things, I'll do certain things. So we put the Word into operation by functioning in our role as we demonstrate our faith by doing what the Scripture says. So I'm going to try to teach you tonight from, uh, in a practical way and uh, give you some benefits. And I hope you have something to write on. I hope you'll take some notes, uh, however you like to retain truth. But uh, I hope you'll take some notes uh, and uh, we can put some practical things into, into operation. Kind of rem- I, read, I heard a story recently that I think kind of illustrates what the Lord wants us to do. I, heard a, I read about a man that was always wanting to win the lottery. And every week, he would pray to God and ask God to help him win the lottery. And he wouldn't win. This went on for week after week. And finally, he read a story in the paper about an immigrant who immigrated to the United States. And uh, the first week that he was here in the United States, he won the lottery. Won a huge amount of money. And it made this man so upset, and he went to the Lord, and he was complaining. And he was saying, Lord, that's not fair. Here all of these weeks and weeks I've been praying and asking you to help me win the lottery. And this guy comes, and the very first week he's here, he wins the lottery. Lord, I'm, I'm asking you again, why don't you help me win the lottery? And God says, hey, fella, help me out. Buy a ticket. So there, there are certain things we have to do instead of just waiting back uh, back for the Lord to do it all. Having said that, let me talk to you tonight about the warfare of the soul. And I want you to go with me for a a base scripture or a text scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you. How many know that's a strong word? I entreat you. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And then he defines what we as Christians are here upon the earth. 
as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Peter is saying you are in a warfare and they are, these are fleshly lusts that war against your soul. That word lust in the Greek literally means the diseased condition of the soul. He said if you don't do your warfare properly, there is the possibility that your soulish realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions will become diseased and uh, you will lose the battle and you will lose the warfare against your soul. Now, I don't have to tell you uh, you're all mature enough in the Lord that you know that you are a triune being. Paul makes that very clear, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he makes it very clear that we are a triune being. It's interesting to me that any time the Lord uh, addresses us as triune beings, he always begins with the spirit going through the soul and then mentions the body. He always says spirit, soul, and body. Most of the time, we natural people, when we talk about us being our, a triune being, we speak about body, soul, and spirit because we're, we're relegated to thinking physically first, fleshly first, moving into the spiritual realm. But God always starts in the spirit and works to the flesh because we are spiritual beings. God wants to deal with us from the, uh, from the point of the spirit. Now, we are born, when we were born again, our spirits were renewed. Do you agree with that? We got a brand new start spiritually uh, when we were born again. But our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions remained in much the same state because our soul came into existence when we were born physically. God breathed into us and we became a living soul just like he did into Adam. But our, when we were born again, our spirits were renewed, made whole, started brand new. That tells us then that our spirit is younger than our soul. Would you agree with that? Our spirit is younger than our soul. Uh, in uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, we are told, and I quoted it to you a moment ago, we are told to work out our own salvation by fear and trembling. And we do that, we work out our own salvation by allowing the Word of God to renew and to restore our soul. And when he said to work out our salvation, that, that literally is in the continuing tense, which means it is a continuous action. It is an ongoing action. It is something that we work at every day. It is something that we never refrain from dealing with. We have to be working at it every day to renew and to restore our soul until ultimately our soul will be saved like our spirit is saved. The Bible speaks about pressing on to the saving of the soul. So our warfare is primarily dealing with the soulish realm of our life, uh, which means that our warfare and our effort in the continuous action of working out our salvation is to bring our thoughts, our desires, and our feelings under the authority of our spirit. The soul being the older realm, the spirit being the newer realm. Romans 12 and 2, you know it well, be not conformed uh, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is in your soulish realm. Now, Romans 8 and 6 says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is to have your soul filled with carnal things. That doesn't bring life, but it brings death. Now, let me uh, see if I can take this a step further with you. There is a story in Genesis chapter 25 concerning Esau and, es and Jacob. The birth of these twins, Esau and Jacob, is a picture, a type 
of the struggle between a soul under the influence of the body and a soul under the influence of the spirit. Let's go to Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 9. And uh, let's take this a step further. Romans chapter 9, verse 10 to verse 13. Romans chapter 9, verse 10. Now he's talking about Abram and Abraham and the seed, which was Isaac. But in verse 10, he says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now let's look at this a little bit. He said that it might happen according to the purpose of God, according to election. What does that mean? It, it means that God favors certain situations and certain individuals according to his divine plan and his divine purpose. It does not mean that he rejects the one that is not chosen. It doesn't mean that. But it means he gives favor to the one who he has chosen. That's the best definition of election that I've ever seen. God does not reject the one that he is not choosing, but he, it, it doesn't mean that, but it means that he is showing favor to the one that he is choosing. So he says, I have made a choice. And he made that choice according to his foreknowledge of these two young men or these two babies that were going to be born, understanding the character of, and the characteristics that were going to be in them, he knew in advance. And so in order to fulfill his divine purpose, he made a choice. He chose the younger over the older. Esau, being firstborn, should have been the one chosen. The birthright went to him. All of, uh, of the benefits of the birthright and the first fruits would have all gone and did go to Esau, but God said, I know him, and, I'm, and I understand he's not going to allow me to work in him to fulfill my purpose, and so I choose the younger one because I, I can see the qualities that are going to be in him that will fulfill my purpose. So he chose the younger over the older and said the older Esau is to serve the younger Jacob. You see that in your mind? That's... That's what I want to talk about. So this is concerning, it's a picture. Esau and Jacob then is a picture, an Old Testament type of the struggle between a soul under the influence of the body, the physical realm, and a soul under the influence of the spirit. Jacob is loved. Esau is hated. The word hated there is meseo, and it literally means detest. God says, I detest the things that I know are going to be manifested in Esau. One translation says, to Jacob I was drawn, but Esau I repudiated. Not because God didn't love, but because he, he saw the characteristics that were going to be in Esau. Now, consider the respective age of our souls and our spirits. As I said, our, so, our spirits were reborn when we were born again. But our souls have been with us since our physical birth. So our souls are older than our spirit. But the, the soul is to uh, be obedient and to serve the younger, which is the spirit. The older is to serve the younger. Esau the older represents our soul, as I said, under the influence of the body. Jacob, the younger, represents our soul under the influence of our spirit. Not just the Holy Spirit, but our reborn spirit. The test for every Christian, then, is will our soul serve the dictates of the flesh, as Esau did, or will our soul serve the spirit, as Jacob did, in his new nature after he was changed to Israel? 
Now there are reasons why God detested the flesh-oriented Esau. God had reasons for that. Go with me now to the book of Malachi, to the first chapter of the book of Malachi, and we'll read uh, the first four verses. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, speaking about Israel, Yet you say, Israel, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not e-? And then God begins to explain. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, that's the, the land where Esau and his inhabitants live, whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, and here's what they said, but we will return, and we will build the desolate places. But here's God's answer to them. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now the word host means army. When God identifies himself as the Lord of hosts, he's calling himself the Lord of armies. In other words, he says, I'm going to respond in a military fashion, and I'm going to deal with this. So Esau and Edom said, we will return. You've caused us to be impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. But thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation for Israel. So Esau's descendants... Edom is saying, we will restore that which has been torn down, but God says, I will restore it. They will build, but I will throw it down. Now, what is that saying to us? First of all, we know that the church in the New Testament is described as a house. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he said, you as Christians, believers, are lively stones being built up into a spiritual house. God's kingdom is also described as a house. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 13 said, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom or that kingdom forever. So the house then that we are built into is to be built by the Spirit. It is built by the Spirit, and it is of the Spirit, and it is not of the soul or of the natural. Esau said, along with his descendants, this was his attitude. This is what God saw in him before he was ever born. That's why God said, I'm going to set him aside. He's going to serve. He's the older, but I'm going to make him serve the other, the younger, and I have not selected him. Esau and his descendants said, that they would build of themselves, which is of the natural order or of the soulish realm. But God said everything you build is going to be thrown down and it will not prosper and it will not last. Now, what that says to us, 21st century Christians and believers, building up the kingdom of our own spiritual lives, building up our own spiritual house, making our contribution to the kingdom of God, making our contribution to the building of the, of the church. What that says to us is that whatever is not built by the Lord through the Spirit will not last. Paul describes it as wood, hay, and stubble. In 1 Corinthians, or in, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I won't take time to go there, but verse 11 through verse 15, Paul said everything that's Uh, The works of men will either be wood, hay, and stubble, or gold and silver and precious stones. And he said it's going to all be tried by fire. And uh, fire destroys wood, hay, and stubble, but it it makes gold and silver and precious stone even more beautiful. It burnishes them and makes them more beautiful. So God is saying that uh, everything that is built uh, outside of the spiritual realm is going to be wood, hay, and stubble, and it will ultimately be burned up. So if we, we're talking now about the warfare of the soul, 
Our lives are either going to produce fleshly results or they're going to be produce spiritual results based on whether our would our, our mind, our wills, and our emotion, where we make the decisions of our life that really controls our life, is either controlled by our spirit or it's controlled by our fleshly realm or our body. Matthew seven twenty six, Jesus likens the building of the natural as having been built upon sand. He said, He who hears my words and doesn't do them is like the man that builds his house upon the sand. And you know the storm comes and destroys it. Obadiah in the Old Testament, the prophet Obadiah in verse 18 confirms this. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. We all have a soul, The soul must be restored, renewed, and cleansed so that it will submit itself and subject itself unto the authority of the younger, which is our spirit, so that we will live a spirit-led, a spirit-fulfilled life. That's the only way we can produce anything eternal. That's why every time I preach and I haven't been preaching quite as long as Marty, but almost. I've been preaching 52 years, and he's about a year ahead of me. Oh, he's three years ahead of me. Uh, But that's because I'm a whole lot younger than he. No, no. (laughs) But uh, every time, and I'm sure Brother Marty does the same thing, before I ever go to the pulpit, I pray and I ask God. I said, Lord, please, one more time, let me speak as the oracles of God. One more time, let your sweet anointing flow through me, the anointing that I have received that abideth within me, according to 1 John, the unction that I have from the Holy One. Hallelujah. Lord, let me speak by revelation. Let me speak under the anointing. Otherwise, anything that I say or do will mean absolutely nothing. Anything that that I do in the natural realm, that I say in the natural realm, is not going to help, but it's going to hurt. And then I pray for those that are listening to me, that their ears and their hearts and their minds will be anointed by the same Holy Ghost, so that they will be able to hear and receive the truth of God's Word. Because you see, brothers and sisters, we are eternity-bound people. We are eternal people. Everything we say and do has an impact on the work of God. It has an impact on the world that we live in. It has an impact on every person that we're in contact with. And it's going to impact them either for now or it's going going to impact them for eternity. And it's going to impact them for how they live now. And it all has to come through the spiritual realm, through the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Ghost lives in our spirit. So the battle is in the mind, the will, and the emotions. And that's what I hope to teach you tonight and the next two nights, Saturday night and Sunday night, to give you something practical that you can take hold of that will help you to live a spirit-led life. Now, one important danger that we need to guard against is a lack of appreciation in our soul for what the Bible calls birthright. Now remember I said to you in Genesis 25, Esau was born first, so the birthright belonged to him. Uh, We as born-again believers also have a birthright. This was Esau's problem. Esau had no appreciation for the birthright, and God knew this. God knew that he would not respect the birthright. Both the Hebrew and Greek words for birthright carry the meaning of firstlings or firstfruits. These firstfruits always belong to God. Birthright, then, carries with it the the meaning of belonging to God. He owns the birthright of our life. Therefore, he is to receive our services throughout all of our Christian lives. 
Uh, slip over to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. He said, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Here, the writer of Hebrews refers to Esau as a fornicator and a profane person. The word fornicate means to traffic or to sell in order to dispose of, of for something else, to dispose of what you have for something else. Esau sold his birthright to get a bowl of pottage. Therefore, Esau is called a fornicator. And so the Hebrew writer is warning us, don't be like Esau. He was a fornicator and a profane person. Therefore, our soul must acknowledge that God owns our lives and he owns the service of our lives. And to refuse to acknowledge this puts us in the category of Esau. Our souls are often tempted to trade a promise of God that's received in the Spirit for something that gives immediate gratification. That's what a fornicator does. They, treat the, they trade, they're willing to trade the virtue of their pure virgin life, they're, they're willing to trade that for something that's a temporary satisfaction, and they trade away that which is precious for something that's only temporary to satisfy, and there is always a price to pay when that happens. So our soul, we don't want it to be ruled under the authority of the flesh or our body, but we want it to be ruled under the authority of the younger, which is our spirit, because our spirit man wants to please God. Hallelujah. That's why Paul in, uh, goes into such detail in Romans chapter 7 to talk about the battle that every Christian has, desiring to do right but finding yourself doing wrong, having the desire to please God but in a constant battle and a struggle to be drawn back to do wrong. But then he goes on in, in chapter 8 and talks about the authority and the power that evolves out of our lives when we're led by the Spirit. And we, we achieve something more than condemnation when we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. So our soulish realm, we are, we are tempted to trade the promises of God that he gives to us in the Spirit for something that will give us immediate gratification. Example. God may give a promise to our spirit from his word that he will provide for all of our finances. There are plenty of promises in the word that says that. Amen? In both the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. But your soul says, I'd like to believe that, but look at all these bills. What good is that promise now? And so the soul under the influence of of the body starts trying to make devious plans, uh, sometimes unlawful plans, uh, trying to draw in the finances that's needed to take care of the bills. When God said, if you'll be led by your spirit man, the promise is in there that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. So being, that's identifying with Esau. It's refusing to trust God, not allowing God to be in the midst of your thoughts, in your mind, when you make your decisions, and making them by the Spirit instead of making them by the realm of your emotions. Now, why is that so vital? It's because we are in a covenant relationship with God. God made it so simple for us to keep our end of the bargain in the covenant because it's, it, it, Jesus took it our place and he, made, he fulfilled our side of the covenant for us. So all we have to do is lead a spirit-filled, spirit-led life through Jesus Christ. Now, in, in Genesis chapter 15, you're all familiar with it. God made his covenant with Abraham. 
Abram said, God, I don't, all I have for a seed is Eleazar. Yet you said you're going to give me a seed. How am I going to know that? So God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And uh, he told him to take uh, a ram and a lamb and, and, and uh, the, the sacrifices and to cut them in pieces. And then he laid the pieces down on either side. And uh, then a, a great sleep came upon Abraham and he fell asleep and he had a dream. And in the dream, darkness came and uh, he saw fowls coming, trying to devour the sacrifice, and he had to drive those off. And God spoke to him about his descendants and how they were going to go into Egypt for 400 years until the sin of the Amorites had reached its extent. And then he's going to bring them in and judge the Amorites and give his seed the promised land. And he did all of that. Uh, as he, and then uh, Abraham saw a, a burning flax and a smoking lamp that represented the presence of God. You ever read that in Genesis 15? I know you have. And it passed between those pieces, sealing that bond and that covenant relationship that God was making with Abraham. Now, that is absolutely vital because we have that same kind of a covenant called the New Covenant in the New Testament. We have a picture of that in the marriage of a man and a woman. When a man and woman marry into the Lord, they enter into a covenant, and God is in the midst of that relationship. Uh, slip over to Ephesians chapter 5 for a moment. I'm not going to take time to read all of this, but starting in verse 21 and going all the way down through verse 33, God talks about the relationship between a husband and and a wife. He starts out in verse 30, 21 by saying that husbands and wives are to submit one to another. A lot of people forget that, and they say oh, it's only the wife that's supposed to submit to the husband. But he said, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of the Lord. And then he talks, he begins to give directions to the wife how she's to submit. And then he begins to talk to the husband, commanding him to love his wife and to, uh, and to, Take care of his wife. And he said, men, in verse 28, he said, So ought men to love their wives as their own body, because he that loveth his wife loveth himself. And no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord does the church. And then he goes on in verse 31, said, For this cause and this reason, a man is to leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now when you go back to the book of Genesis, when God created Adam, Eve was in Adam when God created him. And I, I'm sure you understand that, so I won't take time to explain it. But then he caused the sleep to come upon Adam, and he took, her, took the rib out, and he literally, the Hebrew says, he built a woman. That's why women are so much better looking than men. Listen, ladies, women are the most beautiful creation that God ever created. Come on, ladies, say amen. amen. That's really true. Ladies, they're the most beautiful creature that God ever created. So after he took her out and he brought her to Adam, and Adam said, I'm going to call her woman because she was taken from Adam. Then God married them, and he, he took her out of Adam, and then in marriage he put her back into Adam. You understand that? Woman came from man, but then she turns around and gives man his life, and man then comes from woman. That's a mystery, but that's the church, and that is a picture of the covenant relationship that we have in the New Testament with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus then said, and, and why, why Paul is saying, that for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. There are still two spirits, but they're one flesh. But God is in the midst of that. That's why, that's who holds that marriage together. My wife and I will soon, in a matter of days, be married 57 years. That's not because I'm a good guy, and that's not because she's, a, you know, she's such a great person, although she is. But it's because we have kept God in the middle of that relationship. And the Old Testament says that, uh, that, that, that she is the wife. Uh, she's, she's, she's in the covenant. I can't quote it, Brother Marty. Could, she's the wife of my covenant. What's that, what's that scripture? In one, anyway, nonetheless, 
Uh, so when a man and woman marry, they enter into, it's based on the, on the covenant that God made with Abraham back there in Genesis 15. That's why divorce without biblical cause breaks the covenant because it is based on a decision of the soul that is wrongly in, influenced and it is not a division of the spirit. Every divorce that, that is not for biblical reasons, and that needs a definition, and Brother Marty's got a book that will explain it well to you, Every divorce that occurs without it being a biblical division is, is the result of the soul being influenced by the body desiring to, to trade off something later for something now. And that's called fornication and causes the people that do that in the eyes of God to be profane people. So in that covenant relationship with God, we're talking about the birthright or first fruits. They're all to be given to God regardless of any other demands that are desiring to be satisfied. We owe everything to God first. Then the birthright remains without the selling of it for some temporary satisfaction. The soul, in order to live in that realm, must enter the place of rest, which is the rest of faith. And you read about that in Hebrews chapter 4. The Holy Spirit, the, I mean our spirit, rests in the realm of faith. We need to bring our soul over into that same realm so that the peace and the rest that we have of faith in our spirit also prevails in our mind, our will, and our emotions, waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled. Amen. You understand when God's given you a promise, you know you've heard from God. You know in your spirit that you know that you know that God has spoken and He's quickened a, a promise to you. And by the way, in 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 life, you will never face a situation uh, that you need an answer to. But what if you look in the Scripture? You'll find one of two ways to get the answer. You'll either find a direct verse, a direct Scripture, or you'll find a divine principle. To every problem or every crisis that you ever face in your life, the answer is always in this book. And your, those promises are in your spirit, and your, God speaks that into your spirit, and you can rest in that in faith. Your battle comes in your mind when your thoughts begin to stir up and say, how's God going to do that? How are we going to make that happen? And you find yourself trying to put your hand to it and make it happen, and when you do, God just backs off and lets you try to work it out. And that's when failure comes, regardless of what the circumstances are that you are dealing with. Esau then represents the soul independent, always wanting to take a shortcut. Our souls need to be taught to respect and wait for the Word of God. This is the duty of our recreated spirits, is to rule over that soul. Our spirit must rule over these attitudes, that tempt our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotions. God's Word, which lives in our spirit, must always be involved in the decisions of the soul. If we go to the bank for financial help without seeking God first, we're expressing Esau. If we go for physical help for, from a doctor without seeking God first, we are expressing Esau. If we go to an insurance policy for Protection without first trusting in God, we are expecting and reflecting Esau. There's nothing wrong with doing any of those things, but we need to go to God first. We always need to go to God first. When our soul is allowed to turn to our natural body or our fleshly nature for its identity and its standard of conduct, it will reflect Esau-like characteristics. And what does God say? He says, I hate Esau. He hates that. When our soul is brought under the control of our spirit for its identity and its standard of conduct, it will reflect Jacob-like characteristics. And God said, I love that. So the spirit then, represented by Jacob's new nature, must be strong in God to keep the soul in control. Now, let me wind this up. The way to deal with Esau 
is to look him face to face. No backing up and no compromise. When you read the story of Esau and Jacob, you see Jacob running from the face of Esau, but all this does is cause him more problems. More problems. It was not until Jacob saw God face to face in his confrontation with God at, at Peniel, Genesis chapter 32 and verse 30, it was not until Jacob saw God face to face that he could deal with Esau. Here's an important, an important point. When Jacob learned to fear the face of God more than the face of Esau, then Esau left the presence of Jacob. Genesis 36 and verse 36 says, Then Esau went to a country away from the face of Jacob and away from the presence of Jacob. So the only way to deal with this is to deal with it head on and face it and say, My soulish realm, my mind, my thoughts, my emotions, you can carry on all you want to. You can rant and rave all you want to. You can devise, you can figure, you can try to plan everything out all you want to. But I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to go into the Word of God. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit bring the promises of God into my spirit. I'm going to let them come alive in my spirit. And that's what's going to make my, where I'm going to make my decision. And that's what's going to rule my life. I'm going to be led by the Spirit. When I do, there's not only no condemnation, but there's victory, there's peace, there's joy, there's contentment. And I guarantee you, you'll come out of struggle into victory and into living a victorious, overcoming Christian life. Now, I know I've laid, I've laid a lot on you tonight, but uh, I hope uh, you somehow got a hold of a little bit of it. <laughs> I hope you did. Tomorrow night, I want to deal with it a little bit more. I want, to, I want to take you two more nights into this, and I believe as we do, it will help you to get a hold of it even a little bit better. It, uh, I promise you, it can change and revolutionize your life uh, and uh, teaching you to walk in the Spirit and to be led by your recreated Spirit because that's where the Holy Ghost lives. You know, the older I get, the more dependent I am upon the Holy Spirit. I mentioned to you a moment ago that I won't ever go into the pulpit unless I've asked the Lord to please help me. But I've learned to begin my day with that same kind of dependence upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I cannot tell you how many times that just in my daily activity, in my daily life, when I've had to deal with something and all of a sudden, there is a quickening, <coughs> quickening in me that directs me or points me in a different direction. And it, I suddenly know this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me. I find it happening. <coughs> you younger folks won't understand this, but when you get older, you begin to, it's harder to recollect things. You begin to forget things. And, and I can't tell you how many times every day I'll start to do something and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, you need to go back. Well, there's my telephone. Or you need to do that. You're supposed to do this. And, and I, you see, God, God is just as interested in your everyday details of your everyday life as he is in the eternal things. He's got the eternal taken care of and he wants to work through you to take care of the, of the things in your everyday natural life. So more and more, I'm learning to depend upon him. And I realize without him I can do nothing. But with him I can do all things. But if he's going to rule in me, he's going to have to live in my spirit realm, my, the real me. And I'm going to have to let my, my mind, my will, and my emotions and my body live and walk in subjection to that. Or, or God's just going to back off and say, well, you go ahead and do it. So... Uh, when you, if you're going to win the lottery, you've got to buy a ticket, and then God can bless you. <laughs> and I don't recommend any of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you've got to give God something to work with. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that these simple thoughts and truths that uh, I have kind of stumbled around with tonight, and I realize that, but I pray that somehow the Holy Ghost has taken these wonderful, marvelous, biblical 
scriptural truths and uh, made them understandable to these precious people who have come to hear the word of the Lord tonight. And I pray, I pray, Lord, that they have been etched upon their spiritual mind and heart and even upon the, on their soulish realm so that they can draw from them, not just tonight, but in the days and the weeks that are ahead. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd cause truth to be made real to them. Hallelujah. And that you would bring these truths back to their mind, when, to their remembrance, whenever it's needed. As they, as well as all of us, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Consistently being conformed more and more every day to the image of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Lord, we rejoice in the fact of the great love that you have bestowed upon us and what manner of love that is that we should be called the sons and daughters of God and that it doth not yet appear what we shall be but yet this one thing we know that when he does appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Lord, we have that blessed hope within us, that anticipation that in the interim, in the meantime, Lord, we want to give the benefits of our first fruits and our, our birthright unto God every day to bring honor and glory to his holy name. Father, I thank you for your presence that I feel in this beautiful new sanctuary. And I pray, Lord, that uh, that wonderful sense of your presence that we feel here tonight shall prevail continuously in every time there are people that come into this sanctuary. Hallelujah. That the awesome sweetness of your presence shall touch their hearts and lives. And I pray, O oh God, that uh, multitudes of people that need the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ will be drawn here. I pray that families will be drawn here. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord. Father, we believe that together, collectively tonight, we unite our spirits and our faith together tonight to believe that, that uh, these early days and these beginning services in this lovely new sanctuary, Lord, as we give them to you uh, and, and plant it in the work of the kingdom, that uh, it's just going to be the beginning of, of scores of people streaming in to have the blessing of God touch their hearts and lives as well. Father, we pray to that. We believe for that. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Those promises, Lord, you have put those promises in, in, in this very heart, the very spirit of Brother and Sister Stover and these wonderful associates that work with them. Lord, you have birthed those promises within them. And now, Lord, I pray that from their, at that spiritual birth of those promises within them, that their soulish realm, their minds shall agree with that. Their thoughts shall agree with that. Their emotions shall agree with that. Their physical body will be subjected to the spiritual realm of their lives. And Lord, there will be a great spiritual outpouring of the very awesome presence of God at this location until people around will be asking and wondering and saying and seeking out to find out, what, oh, hallelujah, what is happening, what is taking place at uh, Wellspring Church. Glory to God. Father, I pray that, that you will touch the heart of every person who makes this their church home and that you will work mightily in their lives just as you work mightily in the pastors and the leaders. And Lord, that, that, that they too... Will, will rise up in the realm of their spirit and lay hold of these great promises of God. Lord, may the early days of, of the services of this new sanctuary be as it was in the days of the early church when the scripture says in the book of Acts that the Lord added unto the church daily. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Lord, may you add unto the church daily in the name, the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Folks, I just feel an anointing for us to pray. Won't you begin to lift your voice to God right there? Uh, make your seat 
uh, your chair and altar. And, and uh, let's just call upon the Lord. Oh, Lord, we, we want to please you with everything that's within us, Lord. And, Father, we repent of, of being led by our thoughts and our emotions instead of being led by, by the Holy Ghost in our spirit. Lord, I repent of that. Lord, the, the wrong thoughts that I have, I repent of it because that's in the soulish realm. Lord, the, the things sometimes that I look upon that I shouldn't be looking upon, I ask you to forgive me, oh God, <laughs> because that's in the soulish realm. Oh, mighty God, it's only through our spirit that the Holy Ghost can work. And it's only when the Holy Ghost is at work that the church can be added to daily and that the Lord can add to the church daily. And the church can move forward. For it's not by might nor it's not by power, but it is by the Holy Spirit. Glory to God, saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Oh, Father God, help us to pull down those strongholds which are the vain imaginations that occur in our soulish realm, in our mind. Lord, those vain imaginations that war against the Spirit and, and try to control our lives uh, to, to move us aside from walking in the Spirit. Help us every day to take authority over those vain imaginations, those strongholds. Pull them down, bind them, destroy them so that they will not hinder our personal lives, because when, Lord, when, when, when individuals in the church are hindered because of the soulish uh, domination in their life, it hinders not only that individual, but it hinders the whole body of Christ. And Lord, we don't want to be a hindrance, but we want to be a blessing. Glory. We want to be a blessing. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. We want to be a solver of problems. Uh, uh, and Lord, and one that you can work through uh, to bring an awakening and a reviving and a renewing and a refreshing, hallelujah, to the glory of God. Oh, Lord, help us to abstain from those fleshly lusts so that our, our minds, our souls will never become diseased as a result of those carnal things. Lord, we understand that we're in a world that's full of rank carnality. And Lord, tragically, in, in much... Uh, much of the activity of the church, the corporate church, there is rank carnality. Help us, Lord, to never be moved by that, but to step aside from that, to pull back from that, and, and offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto you, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service, O oh God. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, I'm just trusting and believing that tonight, tonight, is the beginning, the beginning, the stepping forth over the threshold by faith into a new awakening and a new beginning for Wellsprings Church and ministry and activities, both here, Lord, on this spiritual corner, Lord of Lone Mountain and Janelle, this is holy ground, but also down on Maryland Avenue, Lord, in the Revival Center. Thank you for that young lady that came up on the skateboard last night prior to the service and came in. And I was privileged to pray her with her and lead her to the Jesus. And Lord, she, she eagerly responded and went home and got her husband and brought him back. Oh God, let, let, let her be one of the first fruits of multitudes that will come there and multitudes that will come here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit for encouraging us and strengthening us in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and His church, train them in the Word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027 
or you can visit our website www.wellspringministries.com.